Um, my name is uh, Leif Steber. I'm the director of the uh, Institute for Muslim Civilization, Aga Khan University. I've been uh, involved in appointing a new professor today from 9 o'clock in the morning until 15 minutes ago, so I'm quite dizzy. So if I, if I may seem confused, it's absolutely correct. Uh, I am now going to be introducing uh, Rami Khoury, uh, and I'm welcoming Rami cordially to <coughs> ISMC and to London. I first met Rami it's a couple of years ago now in a project concerning parallel states. If we can have two states on the same physical geographical area uh, and how institutions then could be shared by the two states. And it was, of course, Israel and Palestine we are talking about. And the interesting thing uh, is that this project actually materialized in a book edited by uh, Ambassador Matthias Mossberg from Sweden and uh, American academic Mark Devine. And I recommend warmly to take a look at that one, contributions from Israelis and Palestinians on how to do all this. However, introducing Rami is not easy, but mm -hmm. I'll try to do it as brief as I possibly can. No. Uh, you could say that Rami is a Palestinian journalist uh, and an editor, and he has been uh, educated in Switzerland and the US. But for those who don't know it, but for me, who have been quickly surfing uh, on the internet in order to find out information about Rami, I can also tell you that he's the chief empire of Little League Baseball in Jordan, <laughs> which I think is also telling a little bit about his personality. Uh, Rami has worked for several of the prolific uh, uh, journals uh, uh, in the Middle East, like the English uh, or the English speaking ones, I should say primarily. Mm. The Daily Star, the Jordan Times, but also, of course, for famous international media like International Hello Tribune, Financial Times, Boston Globe, and Washington Post. At the same time doing this, upholding the kind of uh, international career in terms of being a prolific and journalist and editor, he has also kept an academic link. So if you look through the CV of Rami, you will also find that constantly in his career there has been fellowships with prestigious academic institutions. And if I mention some, there will be a fellowship in, in, in journalism at Harvard and also a fellowship at the John F. Kennedy School at the same university. There are also fellowships at the Dubai Institute, Brookington Institution, and several other famous institutions, both then in the Middle East and in America, as well as think tanks. More recently, Rami Khoury, for some time, was the uh, director of Isam Fares Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut, in which I think he was, I'm not sure, but maybe the founding director. Mm. The founding mm. director, thank you. And you have just left it and become an adjunct professor of AUB. So, um, having said that, I warmly welcome Rami, and I warmly welcome you all to an evening with Rami Khoury. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leif, and um, thank you to Alex and Leal and others who were so helpful uh, during the day today. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's the first time I come to the university and and the institute. And uh, Leif is confused because uh, he's been working hard all day. I'm confused because I have Arab genes in London, so you have to put up with the. Uh, uh, what I will talk about, uh, but it's it's a great pleasure to be here and share with you some thoughts about uh, a topic that is uh, very dear to my heart and has defined most of my career, which is media and uh, political trends in the Arab world and what's going on in our <clears throat> in our region. Tomorrow I'm giving another talk, which is looking at current uh, trends in the region based on research I've done for the last two years for a book that will be published uh, next year, looking at dysfunctions in our countries and the issues that cause people to, uh, some people to follow extremist groups and do extreme actions like try to swim to Europe and things like that. And really looking at the problems across our region, um, despite many good things that we've done in the Arab world, the current trend is really quite problematic. And um, that'll be my talk tomorrow. Today, I'm gonna, I'll touch just a touch on that. But really what I want to talk about is the interaction between uh, media and political culture 
in the Arab countries, and I'm talking about the Arab countries. Uh, the Middle East has also Turkey, Iran, Israel, other uh, regions. This is just about uh, the Arab uh, political cultures that uh, I want to, to focus on. Um, and we have a problem uh, in the sense that media and political culture in the Arab world have been intimately tied together really since about, really since the 1950s when we had the catastrophic invention of the Arab Information Ministry in the years of Gamal Abdel Nasser in, in Egypt. I mean, it was uh, two terrible, Nasser did many great things for the Arab world and for Egypt, and he can be applauded as he is by many people. But uh, his reign and his rule in Egypt uh, the, brought two of the biggest catastrophes. And I think they may be the single two biggest catastrophes that have uh, shattered the modern Arab world. One was the rule of the executive branch by armed forces. And the second one was the uh, invention of the information ministry. Uh, the armed forces control political power. The information ministry in the modern Arab world has tried to control what is in people's minds. Uh, and the convergence of these two has brought us uh, to the situation today where 78% uh, of people in the Arab world, according to the latest survey by the Arab Center uh, for Research and Policy Studies in Doha, which does systematic surveys across the whole region, the latest survey shows that 78% of Arab uh, families cannot uh, meet their basic monthly expenditures, or if they can meet their basic monthly expenditures, they, ha they don't have any savings, they don't have insurance, they don't have any safety net. So this is a catastrophe that's going on in, in the Arab region. About 45 to 50 percent of secondary and primary school students across most of the region are not able to read and write or do basic math. Um, 15 million roughly people are out of school who should be in school in primary and secondary school. Half of the other ones who are in school are not learning anything. Um, about 50 to 60 percent of labor force in the Arab world is informal labor. People who work for two, three dollars a day, no insurance, no pension, no minimum uh, wage, no maximum working hours, no safety regulations, no contract, no nothing. Um, donkeys essentially uh, masquerading as human beings, uh, but they are they are human beings. They're Arab citizens um, who've never been able to experience the uh, the rights and joys and dignity of citizenship. Uh, in most Arab countries, not all Arab countries are, are, are such a mess, but I just mentioned these quick three or four uh, points uh, out of many others that I'll talk about tomorrow to, to show the degradation that has uh, occurred in the Arab world really in the last 40 years um, to uh, bring the region, which from in the first 50 years of its existence, the modern Arab world, say from the 1920s until the mid 1970s was on a systematic, steady, and rather broad course of sustained development. And one of the reasons you didn't have mass uprisings in the Arab world, you had anti colonial struggles, anti Zionist struggles, anti imperial struggles, anti foreign invasion struggles, but you didn't have the kind of revolutions where people stood up and in the streets to overthrow their leaders. Because from the 20s till the uh, you had demonstrations here and there, you had problems, but but you didn't have mass uprisings. And it's because for the most of the people in the Arab world, for most in most countries, for most of the period from the mid-20s until the mid-70s, late 70s, uh, life was improving, broadly speaking. Uh, it wasn't a nirvana, uh, but life was getting better to the point where people expected if you went to school, if you played by the rules, your life was going to get better and your kids were going to have a better life because that was the reality from the 20s until, let's say, the 1980s, roughly. Uh, after that, things started going downhill for many reasons, uh, which I don't have time to get into now, but they brought us to the situation that we're, uh, we're in today, where political culture um, was taken over by um, autocratic regimes, mostly anchored in security states. Uh, in some cases, direct military rule. If you rattle the names of leaders of the Arab world who were in power for 30 or 40 years, they're all army officers. Uh, Zain al-Abidin bin Ali, Mubarak, Sadat, uh, Nasser, uh, the Assad, um, Omar Hassan al-Bashir, Ali Abdullah Saleh, 
uh, you just go across the region and these army officers took power. And in some cases, they did good things for their countries. They built schools, they built roads. But what happened with this modern history of executive power totally in the hands of armed forces, uh, and which gradually extended that control to the judiciary and to parliaments, making parliaments totally unserious institutions because they neither represented the citizens nor held power accountable. Um, you ended up with a situation starting in the 19, 1990s and the early 2000s where life for most people, instead of getting better steadily as it had been in the previous uh, part of the century, was getting worse for most people. Uh, economic growth was fa not as fast as population growth, uh, corruption took hold, um, there was no accountability, uh, and we continued to have the negative pressures of the Arab-Israeli conflict, perpetual humiliation of Arab political and military structures by the Israelis, perpetual intervention by foreign military forces. Since Napoleon, the Western countries have not stopped militarily intervening inside Arab countries. For 230 years, the Arabs, 225 years, whatever it is, we have had nonstop foreign military intervention, starting first with the West. Now we have the Turks, we have the Iranians, we have the Russians directly fighting inside Syria. There was a period three or four months ago when Russian, Turkish and Iranian officials met to coordinate their military action inside Syria so they didn't shoot each other's airplanes down. It was an extraordinary moment of, of total political incoherence inside the Arab world, inside Syria. And Syria, which was the heart of the birth of the modern Arab world around World War I, uh, is now the heart of the disintegration of parts of the Arab world, not all the Arab world. So if you go to Dubai or if you go to Amman or if you go to parts of Cairo, life seems pretty good, and it is pretty good, for about 10% of the population. If you go a little bit outside those quarters where all the Burger Kings are and the and the internet cafes, life is, is, is difficult for the majority of Arab citizens. And I'll get into more of this tomorrow. The point here is that this political fragmentation due to, polit to sustained political autocracy anchored in not only military rule, but in family rule. So again, you go through the Ali Abdullah Saleh, the Zain al-Abidin bin Ali, Omar Hassan Bashir's, uh, Th these were families, they, their families, their cousins, their wives, their friends, their guards, their chauffeurs, their business associates, and their crony capitalist friends controlled huge amounts of, uh, of these economies. The World Bank did a terrific study on Tunis after the overthrow of the regime, uh, showing the extent of this, and it was quite, uh, quite frightening. Uh, bad enough as that is, Almost none of these patterns have changed since the uprisings of 2010, 2011. Those uprisings were the most significant popular <coughs> expression of discontent in the, Arab, in the modern Arab world, I would say. I don't think we've had anything like that going across the whole region focused on internal affairs. You had Arab nationalist sentiments focused against the West and against uh, Israel in the 50s and the 60s but focused against internal socioeconomic political structures, we've had nothing comparable to the uprisings of 2010, 2011, some of which are still going on in different uh, forms. Um, and of course, that brought about a backlash from the counter-revolutionary forces, creating systems now that are, war that are much more uh, oppressive for ordinary people and their rights now than they were seven, eight years ago. So, so almost all the indicators if, that you look at in the, uh, in the Arab world, almost all the indicators are uh, regressing, um, uh, uh, including the extraordinary, uh, including the extraordinary uh, indicator that for most of the last 30 years or so, population growth rate has been decreasing, which is normal in a situation where women are being educated, development is happening, uh, jobs are being created, popular people's welfare is, is improving. 
Uh, but in the last three years, the population fertility rate and population growth rate has started to increase again in places like uh, Egypt, um, Algeria, and one or two other Arab countries. It's an extraordinary reversal of what is the global uh, natural trend around the world, where with development, with education, with better health care, population rates decrease and, and people's lives improve. Well, in our countries, in most of the Arab world, that hasn't happened. And one of the main reasons uh, for this, I believe, has been the terrible uh, synthesis between political power as it has been exercised by this elite, uh, self-imposed, unelected, unaccountable, never even properly validated by the citizenry in any Arab country, in any kind of credible process of a referendum or an election. And I say credible. You've had elections, referenda, and showing 95% support all the time, and they're still going on. I mean, we have going on in Egypt today the most hysterical process of a presidential election where any viable candidate, even out of that same power elite that the president in Egypt of Egypt is in, any viable new candidate is either arrested or indicted or threatened and drops out of uh, the race. So these things, these, these are not just stories about our past. They are a continuing nightmare of political culture uh, across most of our region. And again, I repeat, not every Arab country is defined by this kind of ghastly situation. Mm -hmm. But the majority of ordinary Arab people suffer the consequences. Even in countries where the rule is relatively um, non-draconian, where governments are not as heavy-handed as they are in Egypt, where they have 30 or 40,000 people in jail, mostly because of their political views. Uh, so if you take countries like uh, Morocco or Jordan or Kuwait which, uh, which uh, or Oman, which are uh, less draconian than some others, even there, the life for ordinary citizens is getting increasingly uh, difficult. And one of the key reasons for this is this intersection between the control of media and the control of the political system. And what we're, what we're witnessing uh, now, uh, in the last, I would say, essentially since the Cold War, the Cold War, the end of the Cold War, the end of the Cold War was the great turning point in the contemporary Arab world as I, as I see it, um, for various uh, reasons that I, I don't have time uh, to explain. But essentially what is, has been going on and is going on still today and has been accelerating in some cases is the, uh, is the gradual fragmentation of the entire region. Uh, I don't talk of the Arab world anymore, I talk of the Arab region, a region where most people speak Arabic and view themselves as Arabs. Uh, but it is not a coherent Arab world anymore. At one point uh, it was uh, moving in that direction, uh, but it's not. Um, and it's, it's fragmenting across the region and it's eroding and corroding from within. And this is the real danger that we're uh, feeling now as we uh, watch uh, developments uh, continue. And when you live there and you travel around the region as I do, you see this happening um, in almost uh, every country. The oil-rich countries in the Gulf are broadly an exception because they're so wealthy. Their native populations are so small that most people have a very good life materially. Um, not everybody. You have problems in Bahrain, you have problems in Oman, you have some people in Kuwait who complain. But broadly speaking, the oil-rich countries, oil and gas-rich countries, um, don't suffer the same internal uh, fragmentations, uh, except probably for Bahrain. Bahrain is in his exception uh, uh, in that case. But the Arab world, what used to be called the Arab world, is now a region of, uh, of four different uh, it's really four different regions. You have a small elite at the top who earned their money either legitimately through professional success or illegitimately through corrupt linkages to the power elite and made a lot of money and still they continue uh, to do that. Many of them 
indirect uh, relationships with imperial governments, like in London, like in Paris, like in Russia, like in the US and other places. So about 10% of the population of the Arab world as a whole, there's 400 million Arabs, about 440 million of them, I, I would say, are really living a very good life. They have no problems and they're set for life. Then I'd say another maybe um, 25, 30% uh, of the Arab world, I would call them middle class in relative to the entire Arab world. These are people who are school principals or they work in a bank or they have a decent job, they have a monthly wage, they probably own their house, they may have built their own house. They probably have health insurance, not all of them do, but so they're, they're okay. They're not wealthy. If there's a crisis in their life, if they have two medical emergencies or something, they, they have a crisis. But about 25, 30% of the people are probably uh, doing okay. So that's 40%. 60% of the Arab world, out of 400 million people, about 60% are in, in dire straits. About 10% of those people have left the Arab world. They're physically left. They've come here or they've gone to the US or to Australia or somewhere, or they're still physically in the Arab world, but they've pulled out of the system. They've joined Daesh, they've joined Al Qaeda, they've joined resistance movements in Syria, uh, militant groups, terrorist groups, whatever you want to call them. Um, they've joined tribal groups, they've uh, joined uh, criminal gangs. Uh, they've essentially disassociated themselves from the po political and economic structures of the modern Arab world, though they still live there and, and uh, survive. And the last 50% are people who are, are living very, very uh, hard lives. Uh, the, the problem with the convergence of the media and of this political structure that has brought us to this very dire uh, uh, situation uh, is that the media has been the primary mechanism of control with the education system, but the media even more important because the, media, the education system catches you for about 10, 15 years and then you, 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 you're not in the education system anymore. But the media perpetually shapes and defines the political culture of the Arab world, tells you what you're allowed to think, what you're allowed to read, what you're allowed to say, what you're allowed to discuss, um, and has uh, shaped people's, has tried to shape people's minds and their whole identities for the last probably 70, 60, 70 years. Uh, since the creation of the information ministry in in the uh, 1950s by Abdel Nasser and the uh, the first military regimes that took power, there were earlier military coups in Iraq and Syria in the 40s, and but it was really in the early 50s in Egypt that we we had this catastrophe of information ministry with uh, with military uh, rule. The, the Arab media today is passing through one of its most uh, troubling and dangerous uh, situations where it has simultaneously fallen, broadly speaking, even here in London and in parts of Europe and in other places, it has, broadly speaking, with some exceptions, it has fallen either under the control of autocratic uh, security regimes, family-run security regimes, or has been uh, bought or intimidated by the uh, wealth of those uh, governments across the Arab world who have a lot of wealth. Not many of them, but the few that do. Um, so there is no, there's no longer um, any serious, large-scale, credible media presence in Arab societies, as far as I can tell. And we've seen this uh, going on for, for some years. We, you always had political money supporting supporting media institutions, newspapers, magazines, um, throughout the region, and, and you can't, you couldn't avoid that historically. There were very few people who made money in the media legitimately, and if they did, they did it not because of their political work, they did it because they published cartoons for children or sexy magazines or, 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 or uh, you know, gossip magazines or whatever. Um, the, the serious journalism in the Arab world has always been uh, directly or indirectly under the control of, of the government 
political systems, partly because they had to license them. Nobody could just start a newspaper. You had to get licensed by the government. You had to be approved by the security authorities, and you had to uh, stay within a certain range of um, uh, of activities. In recent years, uh, this has uh, this trend has worsened because we've had simultaneously going on. I would say in the last. 20 years or so since, again, since the uh, end of the Cold War, what's that, 27 years, uh, since the end of the Cold War, we've had simultaneously in the Arab world globalization, privatization, commercialization, sectarianization, polarization, digitization, and criminalization broadly speaking, of these whole media universes in the Arab world. And what I mean, uh, globalization, that they've basically, what you're seeing in the Arab world is the transformation of Arab media according to the ultimate values of the Thatcher-Reagan uh, philosophy that they created in the 1980s, where the market rules everything, and a core of people in power establish the values that everybody else has to deal with. Privatization, a lot of media is privately owned, but the private owners of the media are very closely linked to the political elites. Commercialization, which means that even if you're not privately owned, if you're government owned, which many media are in the Arab world, they still have to behave like a private company, like a commercial company. They have to uh, cater to the entertainment of the masses to, to gain audiences. Uh, and therefore, they have to act like a commercial uh, enterprise, which dumbs down the media to uh, the lowest level of basically uh, entertainment and, and, and gossip, while at the same time adhering to the lines of political control that the institutions of state impose on them. Sectarianization, we see this happening all over the place, especially in countries that are racked by sectarian fighting like Iraq or Syria but so you've got a lot of media now new media especially that are uh, linked to various sectarian groups religious groups ethnic groups polarization we see this happening as in the United States uh, and parts of Europe you see it in across the Arab world where the, there's very few independent centrist media it's very hard in any Arab country to pick one media institution and say a radio station or a TV station or a newspaper and say, I'm going to just follow this institution, this organization, and get a fair picture of what's going on. It's almost impossible to do that because everybody is uh, to the right or to the left or to the center or following some uh, polarized ideology. Digitization, there's been a lot of professionalization in the Arab world, mainly through digitization and um, um, new uh, technologies uh, that have come about. And this is one of the interesting things that I'll mention, the consequences of the uh, 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 cyberspace and, uh, and the web. And finally, criminal criminalization. The, the, the normal functions of journalists in a normal society are now subject to criminal laws in many Arab countries, many of them. And this is done legally. This is done according to the laws of those countries, passed by the parliaments of those countries, elected by the people of those countries, according to the systems in those countries, which I don't think are credible mechanisms of popular participation or expression or accountability, but they are legal according to the letter of the law. So governments pass laws now that say you cannot criticize um, a, a certain... Uh, a vague, a vague laws that say you cannot uh, um, insult uh, the national government, create national discord, uh, foment sectarian tensions, and they interpret those in any way they want. They're so vaguely written these laws, and then they adhere to the law. So if, you, if somebody's taken to court, they they have no argument. And essentially, we have the criminalization uh, of of basic free expression and normal political discourse if the government wants to define it uh, in in that uh, in that way so we've we've seen especially since the counter revolutions of 2011 and onwards 
we've seen a, a massive uh, reduction, sustained, slow, but now massive reduction of the open spaces that used to exist in many Arab countries, even in Egypt, uh, Jordan, Kuwait, uh, other places, reasonable places that were not uh, necessarily brutal um, uh, uh, security states like some of the other Arab countries were uh, in the past. Even there, in all of the Arab countries, you're seeing the squeezing, the closing of those spaces that used to exist uh, where you could have a pluralism uh, relatively free flow of ideas, debating public issues uh, within certain rules that everybody adhered to, but still allowed for pluralism, debate, discussion, uh, and some, uh, some public exchange of ideas, political, social, cultural, uh, artistic, uh, whatever you want. The advent of the popular uprisings of 2010-11, uh, the increasingly difficult economic stress on most Arab governments, um, and the, um, the advent of cyberspace, where people now didn't have to go to the information ministry to get a permit to publish their views uh, in public. They could just go to their phone and express their views uh, in public. The combination of all of those things <laughs> has created much more severe stresses on the information world um, uh, to the point where now not only are some governments indicting or imprisoning uh, their own citizens for tweeting something that the government doesn't like, we're now experiencing situations where Arab governments in some cases are indicting their citizens for saying something about a foreign, a, a different Arab government, not their own government only. So, mm -hmm. so, so, so we're getting a kind of transnational Arab cooperation in the criminalization of free speech that we've never had experienced in any other trans-Arab national uh, uh, attempt that we've had to cooperate uh, in our region. But in this uh, respect, uh, it is starting to happen. It was a very important signal in June of last year, when the uh, Saudis, Emiratis, Bahrainis, and Egyptians imposed their siege on Qatar, it was a very important signal that they wanted Jazeera closed. Uh, and I think that was the kind of uh, most public open expression of how relatively open media bothers uh, most of the contemporary Arab ruling elites. They don't want uh, open discussion of, uh, uh, of ideas. And that's why um, the majority of really good Arab journalists are leaving the Arab world. And some of them are here in London, some of them are in other countries, or they just go into other professions. They go to teach or they do whatever. Um, but the, the the, the, the quality of journalism inside the Arab world has gradually declined because the opportunity to do real journalism uh, is no longer there. And the siege of Qatar, the demand to close Jazeera, uh, was only the latest sign of the steady control of people's thought patterns and minds and media practices across the Arab world by uh, oil money uh, over the last 15 or, or, or 20 years or so. And it's that, that control over thinking and expression has gone beyond the media scene now in, in recent years. You've seen it in think tanks, in research centers, in other institutions that are not only Arab institutions that are anchored in the Europe and North America, where Arab money is trying to influence those uh, institutions in ways that conform to what the ruling elite uh, wants to, to happen. The fascinating thing is that these governments don't know how to deal with the reality of cyberspace. They try to criminalize what happens in, uh, in Twitter and Facebook, and if you say something that they don't like, they 
take you to jail or they put you on trial or they do something or they expel you in some cases or in some cases people have had their nationality taken away for what the governments think is um, uh, is threatening actions to national security um, but by and large the explosion of popular expression on social media uh, across the Arab world uh, has left most Arab ruling elites confused um, and trouble. They, they don't like it. They don't like people expressing their views freely, but they just don't know what to do about it. They tried in some countries like Egypt, like Bahrain and other places, they would close down the internet. Uh, but, but it didn't last for very long, partly because it didn't stop any of the political sentiments from spreading throughout society, because they quickly realized what many of us have known for years, that the, 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 the mechanism, the network of local grocery stores in central Cairo is just as effective in spreading information as the internet is. It'll take you about half an hour more, but it'll get that information to every person in Cairo who should have it. The barbers, the, the grocery stores, people like that. Um, the, in other words, human interconnectivity in Arab culture is very powerful and very strong. And it's because it's based on trust. Uh, and you will believe something from somebody you know and you trust them, and if they tell you something, you believe it. If you're told something by somebody you don't know, some stranger comes and says, oh, this is going on in the oil ministry or something, and you don't know that person, you probably just ignore them. So the ability of information to spread through Arab society, especially urban societies, uh, is very strong. And when they closed down the internet, it just didn't do anything. The demonstrations didn't slow down, uh, the spread of ideas didn't slow down, and the challenge to the governments uh, didn't uh, slow down. Um, so we have this situation today where there's this explosion of social media, uh, innovation, uh, dynamism, um, um, uh, people uh, with artistic creativity, all kinds of amazing things are happening uh, on the web and uh, the governments just don't know what to do with them. But the net result of all this is that we've now reached the culmination of a process that started with the information ministry of, the, of the Nasser in Egypt in 1952, which is the public sphere of media, including the internet, has been totally divorced, dissociated from the political actions of ordinary citizens. In other words, I can say anything I want on the internet, for the government, against the government, doesn't matter. If I criticize Israel or the US or Russia or Iran or all these different people that we criticize or I praise them or whatever I say on the internet, I can say anything I want. It's not going to make any difference to the exercise of political power in our society, nor is it going to make any difference to the exercise of citizenship rights by the nationals of our countries, many of whom, not all, but many of whom have never exercised full citizenship rights. They're nationals without citizenship, just like many of our political systems are independent without really being sovereign, without really making the decisions that shape their destinies, because there's other forces, regional and global, uh, that have a big, uh, a big impact. So, so the media has become the sphere that is dominated either by uh, pure entertainment or, as we've seen since the Doha siege, more and more in the Gulf, by absurd propaganda, really absurd propaganda. The most outrageous things are being said, um, in some cases by both sides, but mostly by one side, the most outrageous things are being spread in the media um, and um, they're just, they're put out there. And the biggest impact of either these lies or exaggerations or just foolhardy uh, entertainment uh, is that they are destroying what little credibility there was among some of the media that were developing in the Arab world in the last 20 or 30 years. You had some institutions in the Gulf and in other Arab countries, in Egypt, uh, in, uh, in Jordan and Lebanon and other places, there were people in the 60s, 70s, 80s doing really serious journalism when that space was still open. Almost none of that is going on uh, in any uh, significant extent. You have pockets only here and there. 
an occasional column in Jordan, an occasional feature story in Lebanon, an occasional something on, an, on a, a, a clandestine Egyptian website. But in the public sphere, you don't have any kind of serious journalism going on. And, and with the advent of oil-dominated media that are either uh, offering their audiences propaganda or sheer entertainment, uh, the credibility of the of the Arab media as a whole has been almost uh, completely shot. Um, and there's been much more shift onto the social media side where people want to express themselves. Uh, but again, it's totally di divorced from the reality of people's lives. Uh, so it doesn't matter what's in the media anymore. Uh, so the, the Arab media it is like that car that was just shot up into outer space the other day. It's just completely in another universe. It has nothing to do with people's daily, ordinary lives. Because uh, the link, the historical link traditionally in normal societies, uh, free societies especially, is that you inf the, the media informs the citizenry and holds power accountable, whether government power, private sector power, uh, ethnic, sectarian, religious, other forms of power, foreign power, whatever it is, the, the, the media today in the Arab world neither informs people, broadly speaking, nor holds anybody uh, accountable. And this is a, this is a great problem. If you, go, if you look at data from young people across the Arab world, they don't read traditional or read follow traditional media at all. Most of them, uh, if they if people follow government television, it's they want to maybe find out about the weather or they want to find out about a sports team or something. Very few people follow uh, government media for any serious political news because they just don't uh, believe most of it. And young people are uh, almost totally divorced from the political process, and we see this in data again from regional surveys showing that you know, seven, eight percent of young people maybe join political groups or get involved in, um, in um, um, uh, political activism uh, of, of some sort. Uh, and then you have these massive figures showing you something like 30, 40 percent of young people want to immigrate. They're looking to get out and, and leave for good. So the, the problem we were facing now is that the media has reached this situation of a lack of credibility, lack of impact, lack of financial viability, uh, and lack of, uh, broadly speaking, lack of serious journalists. There's still a lot of qualified serious journalists in the Arab world, but they're increasingly less able to do serious work. And they kind of figure out how to survive and, and, um, and pass it on to their children or something. So this is a real dilemma for us. and. Um, I'll, I'll stop with just a last thought um, or two, that the media is simply a reflection of the political culture. Um, so it's, it's easy for us to criticize the media, but I mention these trends because in each case, what's going on in the media is directly linked to or impacted by political decisions by uh, prevailing political power elites all across the region. And the... Um, the real uh, issue is not uh, the media. The real issue is why are citizens or why are nationals in Arab countries not able to enjoy the rights and joys of citizenship? It's because the power structure doesn't really want them to. Uh, the power structure in the modern Arab world essentially fulfills, broadly speaking, again, there's always exceptions, but broadly speaking, the power structure says that Actually, man and woman can live by bread alone. They live by Kentucky Fried Chicken. They live by cell phones. They live by malls. They live by buying and selling land. And you can do any material interaction you want to buy and sell and, and have a good life. But you can't use your mind fully in any kind of serious cultural, cultural or political uh, process. And this is a problem because what is what it means is you're getting the the dehumanization of uh, citizens who are uh, not only deprived of the rights of citizens, 
they're deprived of their ability to use their natural biological functions of thinking, speaking, hearing, debating, arguing, and deciding for themselves. That this essential human element of them has been, they've been deprived of it in the public sphere. They sit at home, so in the Arab world, you go to people's homes, you see this all the time. You have raging debates in, at home, or sometimes a few people sitting in a coffee shop by themselves. So it's not that they've they don't want to do this. They don't want to live like human beings. They want to live like normal thinking human beings. But the public sphere doesn't allow them uh, to do it. And this is going to get much worse now uh, as we witness uh, some of the developments in some Arab uh, countries. I particularly mentioned um, uh, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, where centralized control is creating incredible new constraints on uh, political activism, uh, public expression, freedom of the press. Uh, and these are dangerous uh, trends. There, there's no way that this situation will continue like this. The Arab uprisings of 210 to 11 were the most startling mass public expression um, that the average citizens will not roll over and play dead. They will not acquiesce in their own dehumanization by their own leaders. We're not talking about Israeli colonization, Western imperialism, Iranian intervention, Russian jets. We're talking about their own countries, their own societies are, de are forcing them uh, into a dehumanized state of acquiescence and, um, and silence. And they, they, they don't want to do that, but they don't know how to respond. Uh, if you come to my talk tomorrow, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the particular issues related to these trends around the region. And I will not try to predict the future because I stopped doing that about 30 years ago. <laughs> As a young journalist, I would occasionally try to do that. But I'm much more focused on trying to understand how we got here. What are the, how did we get to this situation where 78% of people can barely meet their monthly expenses uh, and they have to borrow or beg or steal or go to charities or something? Um, and and this this mass this mass deterioration in the quality of life and the integrity that uh, I mentioned, let alone countries like Syria, Iraq, Somalia, Yemen, <coughs> Libya, uh, Palestine, Lebanon, and others, feeling extensive internal uh, fracturing and uh, and fragmentation. These things did not happen uh, because there's something in our water or there's something in our culture or our religion. They happened by bad decisions, uh, by poor leaderships over 40, 50 years with no political accountability by the citizens. And this is the natural uh, uh, consequence. So I, I say we look at the media um, as, a as a mirror that helps us understand these broader uh, dangerous uh, political uh, trends. So I will stop there and thank you very much. Before I uh, open the floor for questions and comments, I would like to remind you that we are people uh, participating online. So wait for the microphone before you, you ask your question, please. Since I have the mic, do I get to ask the first question? What, what can <laughs> uh, I say? Can I say no? No, I can't. You talked about um, the media and how it is not playing its role. What about uh, universities? How controlled or how open the discourse is in that uh, at that platform. Universities. Yeah, so. and also um, the Arabic news channels or newspapers here in the UK or around the world, how much they are contributing towards the discourse within the Arab world or Arab region? Universities, like everything else in the Arab world, have to be licensed by the government. They have to get approval from security agencies. They have to get approval from government ministries, education, information, commerce, whatever it may be. And then finally, they have to get a letter signed by some official that lets them run a university uh, or uh, run a publishing house, which we used to run in Jordan, or anything, any business you want to open, you have to get government security clearance and then licensing. So the, the pressure from the power structure as a whole to control what people do is immense. And they use that pressure whenever they feel if they feel threatened, they they put people in jail. I mean, there's people. There was a guy in Lebanon who was taken to court uh, um, 
because of something a guest of his on a television show, show said, not what he said, what a guest of his said. And when he protested that his guest was going to be prosecuted, he was then um, uh, confronted by the legal uh, system. So, and this is Lebanon, which was historically one of the most free and open societies. So we're seeing um, uh, trends across the region. Uh, in the media, it's the most pronounced. Uh, of course, in the political system, it's the it's the most pronounced in terms of parties and parliament and stuff like that. But the media, I think, is then so universities and other institutions, think tanks, research centers, they all have the same restrictions. Some are more dynamic, more daring uh, than others. Um, if they do serious research, they can usually do it as long as it doesn't infringe on the self-interest of people in the power. Uh, in the power structure, the the media, the offshore media here in in Europe and overseas, it's mostly directly or indirectly controlled by Arab oil money or Arab governments, conservative ones, mostly people leading the counter revolutions. There are pockets uh, of media that are still relatively free, but they're very small pockets, or they're websites that have very small uh, audiences. So the effect um, is minimal. I mean, what you're getting is the, the I think, a catastrophic convergence of Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher, Hamad bin Salman, and Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. I mean, this is, a, this is a nightmare for the use of one's mind and the acquisition of citizen rights. When those four forces converge, the ghosts from the 80s, with the current realities of political power in Arab countries, this is frightening. Um, though these are political leaderships in Arab countries that have done a lot of good things for their people. But in the realm of using your mind and expressing your thoughts, uh, they're, they're creating a catastrophe because the more you bottle up people and deprive them of their, not just their rights, as I said, their biological needs to speak, um, then you build up pressure and it finally explodes one day. Thank you. It's a very interesting talk. You've given an overview of the... Uh, I remember a case of Al Jazeera, which was established some time ago, where I think uh, one of the British ambassadors in one of the Arab countries was instrumental uh, initially, and then started, you see, the, uh, with the object of giving a sort of a bar, unbiased, you see, view of the Arab affairs. What is happening now is, uh, to some extent, you see the uh, the uh, Egypt and the uh, Saudi Arabian, you see now the Gulf state wants to close down the Jazeera because they don't find, you see, very congenial. Uh, of course, I've seen you know, the uh, the inside story as well. Uh, but what I find is so surprising that. It doesn't criticize the Tani family who are financing the Al Jazeera. That they don't give any criticism of their own state because I suppose they, they are controlling. Uh, some of the things uh, the Al Jazeera produces, documentaries, are really very interesting, giving the whole state of the Arab state of affairs and Algeria and all that sort of thing. So I wonder whether there is any possibility of it giving a independent views or uh, what you find is by and large you see the uh, Egyptian and, uh, journalists are imprisoned you say at the moment one of the journalists uh, yeah um, Al Jazeera the original Arabic and then the English one now um, have done great things, I think, to open up the space for free expression and debate across the Arab world. But they're institutions like any institutions. There's very few institutions in the world who are going to criticize the people who fund them. You know, I didn't see uh, CNN criticizing Ted Turner very much when he owned CNN. And so this is part of a natural process. Jazeera is not a perfect institution. They're the best we have in terms of liberalism, but they're not perfect. Um, they have uh, constraints on themselves like most people do uh, in Arab societies. I hear very few media institutions in the U.S. Uh, criticize uh, some of the, say, 
pro-Israeli policies of American government officials, which clearly are against international law, but they they don't do it because the the feed the pushback would be very the consequences would be would be very severe. So every country has its limits on what kinds of things the media uh, can say. But I would say Al Jazeera is the most impressive of what we have, uh, broadly speaking, across the region. Uh, and there's and there the Arabic is more uh, problematic because they have certain people who are extremist in their views. Some of the views expressed on some of the debate shows on Jazeera and Arabic are wild, but they're debates. I mean, that's what debates do. You get people to, to and, and this is where the merger, merger between entertainment and information, come. these are entertainment shows more than serious political information shows. Uh, so that's what I would basically say about, uh, about them. Um, I don't know whether you would agree with me that um, the Arab uprisings failed not only because of uh, the counter-revolutions that we saw, uh, that you described, but also because of the absence of a sufficient structure within civil society or structures to allow, um, let's call them revolutionary forces, to succeed. And that enabled the uh, counter-revolutionaries, including those outside countries like Egypt, to reverse what had happened. Now, extrapolating from that, I know you don't like to predict the future, but it's interesting the, uh, the way in which you describe the further squeeze on public spaces, not only in the media. I mean, if we look at Egypt, for example, it has become totally unacceptable for people to run against Sisi, in the, even if they belong to the military establishment. So we saw Sami Anan, for example, arrested. And the fact that Sisi within the media now is being elevated to sainthood. Uh, and there are some ridiculous clips around that one can see. So as the public space closes further, even if we have another wave of Arab uprisings, um, do you expect that they might succeed in eventually establishing um you know better governance more a more representative form of government governance or will we see another failure because civil society is not being allowed to grow in a way that would you know pave the way for that the short answer is i expect change to happen if present conditions persist and they're actually worsening they're not just persisting they're getting worse and information control is one of those arenas uh, the pressures on freedom of expression uh, are one of the most dramatic recent deteriorations in our uh, in our political cultures. If these persist, that there is definitely going to be some kind of reaction, whether it's mass popular demonstrations, whether it's uh, military violence. Well, I don't know. There's just no way uh, to predict. When, but, or what might happen. Uh, if you look at countries like South Africa or, say, Northern Ireland, um, you might get a situation where at some point some people in power realize that what they're doing is creating their own suicide, their own death, by making masses of their own citizens hate them and one day turn against them. So it's, you might get some people from within the system in cahoots with people in the private sector, probably, uh, and disenchanted people in the armed forces who realize the futility of this long-term system of governance in the Arab world. Uh, possibly, you'll have some changes spark uh, from within. Uh, you, If you get more foreign countries giving up in the Arab world, foreign aid declines, many of these countries are not going to be able to pay their bureaucrats or their soldiers or their school teachers, let alone hire them as they have done for so many years. So I don't know where the change is going to come or how, but I'll talk about more of this tomorrow. But I think if we chart the trends inside the Arab world, uh, we definitely should expect that there's going to be some serious pushback. You're already seeing it in some cases in places uh, like Egypt or other, in Lebanon, for instance, you're seeing it in terms of civic activism, municipal elections, uh, things that we've never seen before. Trans sectarian collaboration in public demonstrations, people demonstrating uh, across sects rather than 
bisect, uh, something, uh, something will happen. You can't deny people their humanity. Um, you can't turn people into animals and expect them not to act like animals. So I think, uh, yes, I expect that the Arab world will, uh, will improve uh, one day, but I just don't know how, how, how it will happen. And the reason I say, because when you, all of us, we know people in the Arab world, we travel among the poor people, among uh, disenchanted people, they're, they're just incredibly kind and patient and, um, and, you know, they, and their values. Here you study Muslim uh, civilizations, uh, the, the values of Muslim, Muslim civilizations are magnificent values, if citizens are allowed to implement them. Uh, so, yes, I'm hopeful for the future, but the future could be a long ways away. I know, I know. I, I, there are f five more hands have been in the air, so I know. I, I know this too, so don't worry. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk, first of all. I definitely feel the pain as an Arab citizen. Get closer to the mic. Sorry, yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, you touched on uh, Gulf exceptionalism in a way. Um, they haven't suffered, you know, in the same manner as the, the rest of the Arab world. In the wealthy states? Yes. Uh, my question is just a comparison between Arab monarchies and Arab republics. Um, it seems like the Arab monarchies in general, most definitely the Gulf countries, they fared much better than the Arab republics. They've avoided the revolutionary nationalism that we've seen since the 50s. Is that possibly an explanation as to why they've done better? Um, both in terms of development and in terms of citizen engagement as well. I, myself from Kuwait, I, I don't think we get the same level of uh, propaganda in the media as we get in other states. And uh, perhaps not, that's not true of Saudi Arabia and other states, but uh, in general, there is a more respected citizen engagement, I feel, in that part of the world. Mm. Yeah, that's a really interesting uh, question and and this comes up a lot we discuss this a lot uh, in the region um, monarchies in my experience the monarchies in the Arab world instinctively feel more responsive to their people than the so-called republics now that doesn't mean they always serve their people sufficiently well or equitably but they've there is a sense among monarchs because they're not there because their people put them in power or voted for them. They're there because they inherited it from their uh, their parents, their father. Uh, so there is that element where monarchs tend to try to be a little bit more responsive. But the major, so you see this in Morocco and Jordan very clearly. There, those are two interesting. So if you want to study monarchies, don't study the Gulf. Study Jordan and Morocco. You get a much better sense of what is it that's a little bit different about a monarchy than a republic. Uh, so, uh, so that's one thing uh, that, that I would say. They have built in shock absorbers in the monarchy systems. If the monarch makes himself, makes it known that the monarch is available to receive the final resort complaints or pleas or requests of the citizens. And this is a fascinating uh, element in Monarchy, monarchies in, uh, in the Arab world. What we're seeing in Saudi Arabia, I believe, is the first case of an Arab monarch acting like an Arab Republican president. Abdel Fat, um, um, Mohammed bin Salman is, has acted to bring all power under his control, like Saddam Hussein or like Sisi. So we have the first Arab Republican monarch. It's a fascinating stage in the modern development of the Arab world. Let's see what he does with it. I'm, I still say it's too early to judge. I'm troubled by what uh, I've see, the way in which he's gathered all this power, religious power, political power, economic power, media power, military power, uh, and social power. Uh, and I'm not sure that letting woman drive or opening movies is sufficient to um, rationalize what he's doing. We really, but we need to give him time to be fair. Uh, let's see what happens in the next uh, two or, or, or three years. I'm troubled though, uh, because we had a hint about this 
which was the um, the announcement of the city uh, neon this uh, incredible city with robots so i get troubled when i see robots presented as the future of the arab world i really get troubled by that and most arab leaders when faced with stresses in their political and economic systems like in egypt like in other places they just decide to go create new capitals so if you want to create a new capital if you want to create robots as citizens well those are options but they're not going to work because there's 400 million people in the arab world only 10 million of them are going to be able to get visas to go anywhere else and the population growth rate by the way in the arab world the population growth rate is um we get about 9 million new Arabs every year now. Egypt alone gets almost 2 million per year. About 12 million Egyptians have been born since the uprisings. Since the uprisings. It's incredible. They couldn't feed and clothe and give jobs to their people back then, and they have 12 million new Egyptians to, to take care of. Across the Arab world, it's around 9 or 10 million new Arabs every year. These incredible population prices. Water is decreasing. Climate change is going to bring catastrophic uh, dehydration. There's all kinds of terrible trends. You can't address these with robots or new capital cities that are funded by money from abroad. And you can bring in all the McKinsey consultants you want. They're not going to solve your problems. This is what worries me. But again, I, I say seriously, we need to give these new rulers in Saudi Arabia a chance to see what they do. The initial signs are troubling, but these are just initial signs. The re reforms that that uh, that uh, Hamad bin Salman has talked about in Saudi Arabia are actually, for internally, are actually very sensible. He's absolutely right about the need to increase the private sector, reduce subsidies, get the government out of funding everything, uh, open up uh, social life, whatever, give women more rights. He's absolutely correct in that. Uh, the problem is n very few Saudis were given a chance to participate in making that decision. That's my problem. There are probably more McKinsey consultants and Booz consultants than there was, um, not literally, but uh, poetically speaking. Um, you didn't have serious citizen participation in making these kinds of strategic decisions. But let's see what he does. It's possible he might prove to be, uh, you know, an Ataturk or something who moves his country in a different direction and. But and, and again, Ataturk, the verdict on Ataturk is, is, is not so clear because, you know, 90 years later, we have this mass Islamist uh, growth in, in Turkey. And now we have a new uh, uh, powerful leader in Turkey and democracy is, uh, is a little bit uh, fragile. So it's hard to tell how these things happen in the long run. But I, I would wait to see what happens. But the general, uh, I, I don't think monarchy in itself is the real um, I issue in the final analysis? It's the it's the nature of uh, of how power is uh, is used in society and how ordinary citizens feel whether or not they are taken seriously uh, uh, as citizens. Thank you. I just wanted to return to your repeated use of the. Uh, sorry, bring that mic closer. I just wanted to return to your repeated use of the public sphere in relation to artistic creativity, um, because whether you take Habermas or Hauser's notion of the public sphere as being a, a space defined by real or virtual, uh, but people coming together. For artists, there's such a struggle now. I feel that the notion of occupation, the notion of censorship, the notion of destruction of work for many artists, from Palestinians to the Arab world. I'm just wondering, is there any new discursive, discursive spaces we could be talking about where we're not getting a skewed idea in the West of the Arab artists trying to find a space in which they're not burdened with the notion of conflict or occupation? Well, I mean, yeah, the, the majority of citizens, I think, in the Arab world, they're not all politically active in public, but in their hearts and sitting in their living rooms, they just want to live a normal, they just want to be treated like normal people. They're not looking for wealth. They're not looking for power. They're not looking for revenge. All they're looking for is normalcy, human normalcy. They, they've they never enjoyed it in the last 50 years. And that's what they desperately seek. And th they don't always express that in public. Uh, but yes, I think there is a strong popular 
yearning and demand to get away from this tightly controlled power structure that uh, controls every aspect of their lives. It was fine. They didn't complain much until the 1980s. In the first 50 years, they were, even when you had power structures becoming quite autocratic in the 50s and 60s and 70s, but life was still improving for most people. So you didn't have huge you know, rebellion against this because their life was getting better. And the same was true in, in South Korea and Taiwan and Malaysia and Indonesia in the 1970s. Life was getting better in very autocratic regimes. Material life was getting better. Healthcare was getting better. Telephones were going all over the place. Education was expanding. So people put up with lack of political rights if material situations are improving and they think their kids are going to have a better life than they did. They put up with it. But once that stops, political control is strengthened and material development weakens, then they become, uh, they start becoming desperate. And I'll talk about this tomorrow in more, uh, in, in, in more depth. Uh, but you asked about artistic and cultural space. Um, yeah, the, you know, pu public art historically around the world, broadly speaking, I'm not an art historian, but being an Arab journalist, I can speak about stuff that I don't know about, it's all right. <laughs> broadly speaking, art historically and culture, poets, artists, and so, is either about love, so a Valentine's Day, love to all the ladies, especially my wife back there, where she is. Um, so art is about love, or it's about protest, cultural protest, political protest, social protest, economic protest. And the art and culture world is the uh, last domain where the political control mechanisms have not been able to completely squeeze people for two reasons. It's an intangible that they're trying to control. So artists can can stuff produce stuff and, and, and send it out overseas and get it published and it'll circulate on the internet. Poets can do their stuff, writers, and they do this all the time. Incredible novels are being written and poetry and, uh, and stuff. We're working on a project on this at uh, an AUB of art and culture in the Arab world. Um, and, and the governments and political power structures, not only governments, you know, religious institutions, uh, private sector institutions, ethnic institutions, they can't control culture and the art because it's the expression of the inner soul of human beings. And they can't control that. That's, that's deep, deep inside. They can control what you read in a newspaper, but they can't control those inner sentiments. And they, these sentiments will come out. The internet uh, helps that um, a lot. And, uh, and, and some of the most amazing creativity and artwork happened during the uprisings um, in public art. Um, so I expect that this is going to become an increasingly important sector in, uh, in, in Arab life. Can we ask Arad? Oh, no, we have, we have uh, an order. I, I'm trying to follow an order. So that's ah, okay. the person down there and then the gentleman over here. Then we'll come up to the front. <laughs> and I, we have one more question which added there. So if we have uh, short questions and relatively short answers, it will, be, it will go fine. Thank you Please. very much for your, uh, for your very interesting presentation. I came late, so I'm not sure if this point has been discussed or not. But uh, my question relates to Another question which was just asked before me, I mean, a couple of questions before me, it's about your view. What do you think, uh, whether or not the definition of the success or failure of Arab, Arab Spring is a very subjective matter and, and it goes beyond uh, <coughs> gathering of some ordinary citizens on the roads. And uh, there are forces which go well beyond those ordinary citizens, like how much, uh, I mean, uh, do you think that uh, the, the alignment of foreign uh, policies of big powers with big, uh, like, uh, 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 Middle Eastern countries has something to do with the success or failure of the recent uh, uprisings? Thank you. Well, I think, um, the, of course, there's a variety of views about the uprisings in the Arab world and abroad. My sense is that the majority of Arab people wanted the uprisings to succeed peacefully. They wanted reform. That's what the uprisings were about, reform. And then 
when reform demands were met by police state vicious retaliations with foreign silence or acqui acquiescence in many cases, then uh, uh, the reform demands be turned into resistance, protection, self-defense, and then military, and then the jihadis came in and it was all over. So um, there were many reasons why the uprisings didn't succeed, which I'll, I'll talk more about that uh, tomorrow, but the, the fact is they didn't succeed. Um, the fact is also that the majority of Arabs wanted them to succeed, which we know, again, from survey evidence, incredible. We have a lot of insights into what ordinary Arabs think today, which we didn't have 20, uh, 20 or 30 years ago, from polling and from all kinds of other uh, uh, mechanisms. Um, so I would anticipate that people will keep searching for different mechanisms, different ways to achieve that ultimate goal that they want which is a dignified, normal, decent um, decent life. And you've got people like in the private sector who have a lot of power in the Arab world. I think the private sector is going to be a critical community. I think the, the women uh, of the Arab world who have remained by and large a silent and invisible community with a few exceptions of activists here and there and writers, but by and large the impact of women on their societies um, hasn't been felt yet and we'll see how that plays a role. It played a role in Northern Ireland, it played a role in South Africa. So we'll see uh, which sectors in Arab society that have uh, were not able to impact on the progress of the uprisings may have a chance to do so um, in the next phase of national transformation. Uh, my, my question is about how much the Western media is aware of the situation in the Arab region that you have discussed and how much their journalism affects the policies of Western government in dealing with the Arab regime. I think individual journalists in much of the Western world are very aware of the reality, especially those who are correspondents in the Middle East, who live in the Middle East or travel to the Middle East. They know these realities. If they are real journalists, if they sit in the capital and just talk to a few people <coughs> in hotels and bars and um, uh, government officials and, and intellectuals and stuff, they but if they travel around, if they go to ordinary villages, if they go to middle class and lower income areas, they know very well what the uh, situation is. They don't report it as well as they should, unfortunately, partly because the demand from their editors isn't for that, and partly because it doesn't sell dog food advertising in the Western world. I mean, uh, journalism is a commercial business. It's not a, a charitable society. Uh, journalists, uh, news media organizations want to gain audience share so they can sell dog food advertising and car advertising and, and tomato ketchup advertising and, and that's what they do. They make money by catering to getting a large audience. There is not huge demand in the Western world uh, for <laughs> the views of ordinary citizens who feel degraded uh, across the, uh, the Arab world. So that's one reason. The impact of the Western media broadly, so again the Western media is very varied so but you, you asked it, so I'll answer it. Um, they, they have minimal impact, I think, on the uh, decision-making of their uh, governments. Uh, the foreign policy issues are not high on the agenda of most government officials, uh, and therefore they're not high on the agenda of media, uh, unfortunately. The internet has plugged the gap there, so if you live in the Europe or North America or Japan and you're really interested in the sentiments of middle-class Arabs or village farmers in the Arab world, you can get that on the internet. You go find a website and you can get it. But it's not in the public sphere um, in a very big way, unfortunately. Thank you, Rami. Uh, you've described extremely well, and I think actually depressingly well, uh, the problems that the region faces, or many of the problems that the region faces. Uh, I wonder, though, if you have an explanation from where, for where all of this comes from. I mean, what, what is it about this particular region that makes it so difficult to actually move beyond the flaws that it has suffered from uh, for the last two, three, four hundred years? Is it religion? Is it Islam? Is it the Ottoman past? 
is it uh, the, the colonial and quasi-colonial relationships with the West? Is it an identity problem that people have in that region? Is it genes that can't be controlled? <laughs> Sorry, that was a private joke. <laughs> what is your explanation? Why is this sorry state? So sorry. Well, this is again a question we discuss three times a week, and and I've certainly discussed it for the last 50 years of being a journalist and living in the Arab world. My explanation is there's a there's a unique convergence of several factors in the modern Arab world that don't exist anywhere else in the world. So a perfect storm. A perfect storm, and these, as far as I can see them, and I'm not a historian, but this is from my analysis based on living through the modern Arab world. Um, it's the um, the presence of oil, which has distorted so many aspects of our economies and political systems. It's the nonstop military interference of foreign governments for the last 220 years, nonstop. And that's escalating, by the way, with drones and special forces and military bases. Foreign militarism now with <laughs> Turkey, Iran, Russia, and you now have inter-Arab militarism. The UAE is creating bases in the Red Sea, and Saudis and UAE attacked Yemen, and they're involved in Libya, and the Qataris have done stuff here and there. So the, so the non-stop trans-border trans militarism by foreigners mostly, but also now <coughs> by Arabs, the non-stop uh, conflict between Zionism and Arabism since the... Well, since really the 1930s in a big way, uh, the, the direct and indirect impacts of the Arab-Israeli conflict, one of the impacts of the Arab-Israeli conflict was military men taking power in the 40s and 50s, which leads to a lot of these catastrophes. And the um, transition that happened uh, early on in Arab modern life uh, in the 20s and 30s and 40s, the transition from independence or independence in quotation marks that was still heavily reliant on foreign colonial support and manipulation and quickly made a transition to military rule in the 40s and 50s. Um, and finally, strategic geography. Starting, you know, the British needed a place to to fuel their planes on the route to India and on the route to Kenya. And the, when the British created a base in Aden, the French came to Djibouti to confront them. So the, the, the strategic geography of our region for Western uh, powers, but also for the Russians, if you go back to the 1910-1920s, the strategic geography of our region which was manipulated by foreign imperial powers without any serious input from people in the Arab world. And by the way, we see this today. In, in 1915 and 1920, imperial powers were sitting in Paris and London and, and other places creating a new Syria. And they're doing exactly the same thing. They're sitting in Sochi and Vienna and Geneva and Astana, and they're trying to write a Syrian constitution. You know, next thing they're going to bring McKinsey in and say, we're going to write a constitution with a serious word. I mean, it's incredible. The nonstop international penetration, manipulation, exploitation, and domination and control of our resources, either directly or indirectly, either by their own military presence or by manipulating local elites, is nonstop. So I would say those factors together have created this situation. There was a brief window in the 30s and early 40s in some Arab countries where you had real pluralism, you had elections, you had popular sentiments being expressed by labor movements, by political groupings. Uh, but that was a very brief window and it quickly closed when the power elites with the international forces together uh, stopped it from developing. And then of course, once you had the Arab-Israeli conflict and Israel and, and the, the clashes those brought the military rule, and then you had oil a, a bit a couple of decades later, starting big big oil in the 60s and 70s, um, and, it, and it was impossible by then for ordinary people to even have anybody listen to them because the powers 
in their countries regionally and globally were so focused on maintaining control for some reason. Uh, and then you had the Cold War on top of that. So that combination strikes me as a pretty plausible explanation for how we got to this very sad uh, situation. But you still have today millions and hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions of ordinary Arabs pushing back against this. They will not acquiesce in their own dehumanization and brutalization. They will not just roll over and play dead. They don't know what to do. They're trying to figure it out every day in millions of households. People are trying to figure out what do we do? How can we improve ourselves? One day they will uh, find the answer, I'm sure. There are two more questions. One here and the last one, the one down there. Thank you so much for your <clears throat> tour de force. It's been absolutely amazing. Um, my question regards Sufis and the antagonism towards the Sufis from certain quarters. Towards the Houthis? Sufis, S-U-F-I-S. Sufis, S-U-F-I-S, the Sufis? Tasawuf. Tasawuf, Sufi. Suf? Sufi. Sufis, ah, Sufis. Sorry. Sufis, yes. Uh, if you could comment on the antagonism, I'm very conscious of the assassination a year and a half ago of Amjad Sabri of the Sabri brothers. And I'm just interested in your views on this antagonism and how we could build a bridge between the two perspectives, because it seems to me to be a monumental misunderstanding, a tragic misunderstanding. Perhaps just briefly, if I mention, I'm currently doing a book on this subject, which will help build a bridge between um, the non-Muslim world and the Muslim world, and between the Sufis and the fundamentalists who um, don't appreciate that they're actually coming from the same place. They're both um, devoted to the Holy Quran, to the Hadiths, and um, the forwards being written by the former senior editor of the Lancet Medical Journal, Arthur Yawa, who's an Oxford-educated psychiatrist. And um, he's hugely enthusiastic about the book. But I just very much appreciate your views on the situation and how it could be moved forward. Please. Well, this is genuinely a topic that I can't really comment on uh, very much. You have the experts here, so come come back here and sit with these guys and, and ladies, and they'll tell you about that. I My impression is that it's obviously a, a, a question of ignorance at one level and scapegoating at another. If it's not the Sufis, it's homosexuals or somebody else or um, anybody who's different. If you're under stress and you can't express yourself politically and you can't take action in a normal way in your society, uh, you're going to flail out and try to find somebody and beat them up. And um, so it's like people in Europe here uh, uh, criticize Muslims, criticize immigrants, criticize Africans. Uh, the, in the United States, it's Mexicans. So it, this is normal. It's abnormal behavior that normal human beings engage in when they're under great stress and they just uh, and, and they're ignorant at the same time. Um, that's my impression, but this is not a scientific uh, analysis because I really don't have any insights into that, but uh, maybe life and others could, uh, uh, could tell us. There, you also have a lot of places in the Arab world where Sufis are perfectly accepted. It's not, not everybody is against the Sufis, but you get some extremist, hardline, militant, um, religious fundamentalists who are really way out there on the edge, and it's they, they're the ones who go around uh, doing these things. Um, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, I will just um, I have a question regarding, um, so you talked at great length about um, how the state of public debate and public discourse has been regressing in the region. Um, and you've also discussed a little bit uh, some of the external factors that drive into that, such as the oil and the foreign intervention and uh, Cross Arab world uh, military uh, expansionism. Um, am I, and you believe that 
things have to change uh, as long as this uh, state is constant or maybe worsening. So my question is, um, what would stop um, the state of Arab affairs from deteriorating further into a scenario similar, in, at least in the political and social sense, similar to things that we can find in um, China or North Korea, or even more related to the Arab world in Algeria, where um, we reach a sort of a totalitarian state that controls all aspects of, of social life. Um, so my, my question is, if everything, as you said, is going downhill and therefore there has to be a change, uh, what do you believe is the reason that change is coming rather than things will just continue to go downhill until we reach a state of a totalitarian uh, state in that world? Thank you. Because I believe in the common Abrahamic principles that God loves us and justice is in our destiny. Uh, I say that seriously. Uh, I, I, this is what most people believe. Um, and um, and I see it, I mean, I, I've been traveling around the Middle East for 50 years talking to every kind of person you can think of, from the far right to the far left, militants, this way. Um, and it's just so clear. You know, you don't have to be a particularly good scholar or a good journalist. You just have to be a normal human being whose eyes are open and whose ears are open, and you listen to what people say. People have been telling us. I wrote an article which you can find online. It's called The Ten Early Warning Signs That We Ignored. It was published in a journal in, in, um, in, in English in Italy. It's called The Ten Early Warning Signs That We Ignored. Looking from the 70s until today, 10 warning signs that I so mentioned that were warning signs about our societies becoming increasingly stressed and showing extremist behavior of some, of some sort political, mm -hmm. religious, economic, uh, whatever, uh, personal behavior. And so we, 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 we got to this point today in a slow, gradual uh, process. And the people who are doing terrible things today, violence, corruption, hatred, sectarianism, uh, and desperate things like swimming with their kids to Greece, these were people 20 years ago who are neighbors working in grocery stores or driving a taxi or teaching in school. These, these people became desperate because of the conditions in their societies. And many people are to blame, as I mentioned. Um, so that's why I'm confident that this condition will not stay like this forever. The other reason I'm confident is that it cannot physically, biologically stay like this. If people don't have food, don't have water, don't have jobs, don't learn anything in school, they physically cannot exist. This is not an ideological revolution that we're talking about. This is a biological revolution. People need to sustain their, their metabolism first and foremost. They need to feed their cells with protein and carbohydrates and sugar and, and fat and, and minerals and vitamins. And they're increasingly less able to do this now than they were 20 and 40 and 60 years ago. And they will somehow, when they reach a point of mass desperation, they will do something. I don't know what it is, uh, uh, but this is, again, I'll talk more about this <clears throat> uh, tomorrow. This is, this is not exclusive to the Arab world. This is human nature. Black people in the United States did this. People in South Africa did it. In, 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 every, in, in East Asia, the, in East Asia, people agitated when they got middle class status, not because they were poor, but when they became middle class in the 70s and 80s, under autocratic regimes, their living standards increased in East Asia, the tigers, they demanded more normal human rights, uh, speaking out, participation, elections, accountability. So they demanded citizenship because they were getting wealthier. We're demanding citizenship in our countries because we're getting, many people are getting poorer and more desperate. So again, I don't want to get into the, uh, into the future, uh, but any honest, reasonable person who looks at the conditions and, and, and listens to what people are saying will, will have to reach uh, the same conclusion. Okay, thank you very much.
Before I say thank you to Rami, take this one and you have the information about a couple of more lectures we organize. If you need more information about the Institute, you find it on the table in the back. Uh, thank you for coming and join me in also thanking Rami Kuru. And warmly welcome tomorrow as well.